Dear friends, welcome to Christchurch Georgetown on this, the second Sunday of Pentecost. Today is also, I understand, Flag Day. In the same year that this church was built in 1885, a Bernard J. Sigrund, a school teacher from Wisconsin, held the first recognized observance at his school there. In these troubled times, it's good to reflect on those things that unite us, and the flag is one. Here at Christ Church, we're also always aware of the poem that became our national anthem, as it was written by one of our founders, Francis Scott Key. As Christians, we are united not by a flag, but by the person of Jesus Christ. And in days not blighted by pandemics, no matter who we are or what we think, we all kneel at this altar behind me to receive the sacrament of his body and blood together. Today, I invite you all, parishioners and those joining us from around the country and the world, to join our hearts and minds in prayer and praise that we may be one, even as Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. Welcome.
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia.
Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father, Father and, and to, to the, the Son, and, and to, to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and, and will be forever. forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. And when they set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, they encamped in the wilderness, and there Israel encamped before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice, and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called to the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Here endeth the lesson.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every infirmity. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every infirmity. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Math Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon and Can the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, charging them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and preach as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Take no gold, nor silver, no copper in your belts. No bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay with them until you depart. As you enter the house, salute it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear testimony before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you up, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver up brother to death, and the father his child, and the children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Here endeth the lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in thee can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under thy care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let thy way be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Keep, O Lord, we beseech thee, thy household, the Church, in thy steadfast faith and love, that by the help of thy grace we may proclaim thy truth with boldness and minister thy justice with compassion. For the sake of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that we, being ordered by thy governance, may do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the world that God has made, for its peoples and nations, for those who serve in local, state, and federal government, and in the armed forces. We pray for those who work to address the issues raised anew by the killing of George Floyd, and to bring change. We pray for this city, and all who live, work, study, and worship here. We pray for justice and peace. We pray for the church throughout the world, for this diocese, for Marianne, our bishop, and for the clergy of Christ's church. We pray for the mission, ministry, work, and witness of this parish, and especially this week for our partner in mission, the Washington School for Girls. We pray for all who have been affected by the global pandemic, especially those who are members of the Christ Church community. 
We pray for all who are on the front lines of the fight against the coronavirus, especially doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers, for researchers, and for policymakers. We pray for an end to the crisis and for the restoration of health, wholeness, and stability. We pray for those on our parish prayer list, Judith Atkins, Dennis and Karen Lamb, Donnie Lancaster, Sarah Mashek, Michael McDuffie, Stafford Nibley, Sophie Nicholson, Kit Thompson, and Tom Stouffer. And for those who remember now, either silently or aloud. We pray for all thy servants to part at this life in thy faith and fear, especially Catherine Kaiser, and for those who remember now, either silently or aloud. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. We give thanks for all the blessings of this life and for the strength and resilience of this parish community. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and has promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai and said, Tell this to the people of Israel. I have, you have seen what I have done to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine. But you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. When I first saw the video of George Floyd's death, I was numb with horror as I heard him gasp, I can't breathe, and then saw the face of Officer Derek Chauvin looking up calmly, almost nonchalantly, as he pressed his knee against Floyd's neck. Within a day, I couldn't get the words, I can't breathe, out of my mouth and out of my mind, and I found myself alternately sobbing in tears and then clenching my fist in a rage. It turns out that much of the whole world was having the same reaction. In her sermon at the Washington Cathedral last Sunday, Bishop Mary Ann reminded her listeners that this was nothing new. Yet for a moment, I found myself naively asking, how can this be? while at the same time asking, more importantly, where are we going? This morning, I want to share with you for a few minutes a reflection on remembrance and of how so often we collectively forget where we've been, but then to realize anew that God calls us to be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. The words that I quoted from Exodus this morning, which God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, have echoed down to us in our Christian tradition in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, the writer proclaims, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In the wilderness, the people of Israel are called to remember what God has done for them. He has delivered them from slavery and freed them from the Egyptians. The book of Deuteronomy continues to emphasize the theme of remembrance, as Moses repeatedly tells the people about to enter the promised land that they are to remember that it is by the grace of God and not by their own power and might that they are gifted with the new land. The theme of remembering is celebrated regularly in the Jewish faith and the observance of the Passover Seder. And yet, we know that the people of Israel forgot quickly where they had come from. The great biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann points out the supreme irony of the once delivered slaves of the Egyptians turning into conquerors when they enter the promised land, laying cities to waste and killing the inhabitants. At the first gathering of the World Council of Churches in 1948, the American theologian Reinhold Niebuhr remarked, to yesterday's oppressed peasants become tomorrow's commissars. And so it is in our own American history with the exception of the Native Americans, we are a nation of immigrants, bound for the promised land, except for those brought here in chains against their will. But many white folks came here escaping from political and religious repression in search of a new life and a new beginning. But instead of remembering who they had once been, they forgot. The fabled story of the pilgrims gathered in harmony and thanksgiving at a great feast thankful that their newfound Native American friends had helped save their depleted ranks by providing resources of food and crop production as a sequel. Within a generation, those same Native Americans were demonized in the Massachusetts Bay Colony as agents of Satan who must be destroyed. The way to regulate the world would be through the regeneration of violence. Our bishop reminded us last week that much of the American prosperity in the early days of this nation was founded on the backs of African-American slaves. So let me take a risk here by sharing a bit of my own family history. In 2007, while on sabbatical, my wife and I journeyed to Scotland, my only visit thus far to Father Tim's native land. There we went to Collinsay, an island in the Inner Hebrides, which was the ancestral home of the McDuffie clan. Next to Collinsay is a smaller island, Oransay, only reachable by walking there during low tide. There we found the ruins of the, the Oransay Priory and the tombs of many McDuffies who had been priests and members of the monastic community 
which ended around 1580 during the Scottish Reformation. The Macduffie clan itself was dispossessed in 1613 with the killing of its last clan chieftain. They were absorbed into the McPhee clan. The Macduffies suffered further indignity and brokenness after the Battle of Culloden in 1746, when they supported the Jacobite uprising of Charles Stuart, who claimed the English throne and was soundly defeated in that battle. With their fortunes at a low ebb and with great hope of finding a new life in the colonies, my forebears came and settled in the sand hills of North Carolina, where they became prosperous farmers. And here I must confess that I discovered that by the beginning of the 19th century, they were a slave-holding family with one of the largest numbers of slaves in the state. Yesterday's oppressed peasants become tomorrow's commissars. Last summer, Mary and I were in Charleston, South Carolina, where I was a preacher at a wedding. We visited the museum on the site of the slave market in Charleston, and while walking in the streets, I learned of a more, more about a distant relative named George McDuffie, who was the governor of the state in the 1830s and later a United States senator. He was an ardent supporter of slavery and was opposed to any federal legislation that might endanger its existence. I must report that my McDuffie forebears, who by the time of the Civil War, many of whom had migrated to Georgia, fought for the South, fought for the preservation of slavery. Fast forward to 1968, when I recall one of my father's cousins visiting with my father's youngest sister in Columbus, Georgia, where my father grew up and where his family had lived for generations. My cousin had become a liberal Democrat, and he said to me, John, I sat there on your Aunt Mary's front porch on a beautiful, warm summer evening. She was the flower of Southern womanhood and beauty, and I was aghast when the conversation turned to politics in the presidential election that year, and she suddenly said to me, you know, we are Wallace people, referring to George Wallace, the segregationist governor of Alabama. This is some of my family heritage, which I carry, of which I am not proud. Many of us white folks carry some of that heritage as well. I can tell you I had my own personal up comeuppance in the early 1980s on one night when I carried my saxophone into a, to try to join at a jam session at an African-American jazz club in Norfolk, Virginia. I was greeted at the door by a black hostess who smiled as I peered inside and saw that among the large crowd there, there was only one white person in the room who was playing upright bass. I nervously said to the hostess, is it all right for me to be here? She looked at me up and down and she said, I don't know. I'll have to show you to the back of the club, to the back door, and let you talk to the owner. So she led me outside into the back door of the club and through the door into a kitchen the owner was sitting drinking a cup of coffee. She said to the owner, he wants to know if it's all right for him to be here. The owner seriously looked at me and paused for maybe as long as half a minute and then said, I think we'll let you in here. And then he and the hostess burst into hearty gales of laughter as if to say, now you know a little bit about how we felt all of our life. That club became one of my favorite places in Norfolk. But back to Governor George Wallace for a moment. I told this congregation back in January on the Martin Luther King holiday weekend that in 2016, I participated in the annual historic civil rights tour led by the Reverend Jim Stowe of the Montgomery County Office of Human Rights. One of the places we visited was Selma, Alabama, site of the Edmund Pettus Bridge where Bloody Sunday took place on March 7th, 1965 when those attempting to march to Montgomery from Selma to advocate for voting rights for African Americans crossed the bridge, only to be met by state troopers mounted on horses and armed with clubs and tear gas. They were there under orders by Governor George Wallace. We were given a tour of Selma by Joanne Bland, an African American woman who was on the bridge that day as a 14-year-old. She described the horror of the attack on this group of peaceful marchers the horses bearing down, the tear gas, the beatings, and her falling on the bridge and coming to consciousness later as she sat holding the bloodied head of her 12-year-old sister in her lap who was crying. Joanne led us to the place where the march began, led by John Lewis and Hosea Williams. Many people know about John Lewis, 
suffered a fractured skull on Bloody Sunday and who has served for many years in the House of Representatives. But they know less about Hosea Williams, who was an ardent champion of civil rights also, who served in the Georgia State Senate and later on the Atlanta City Council, for whom a street was renamed in Atlanta shortly before his death from cancer in the year 2000. As a young man, Williams enlisted in the United States Army during the Second World War. He was in an all-black regiment under the command of General George Patton. He suffered through a particular bombing in which he was wounded and was the only survivor. He spent over a year recuperating in a military hospital and was awarded the Purple Heart. When he returned home from the war, and he was in full uniform and took a drink from a whites-only water fountain at a bus station where a group of angry whites who had observed this savagely beat him. They beat him so badly that they thought he was dead, and they called a black funeral home to come pick up his body. The driver of the hearse noticed that Williams was still breathing and had a faint pulse. There was no local hospital that would admit a black man for treatment. He had to be driven 100 miles away to a veteran's hospital where he stayed for more than a month. Listen to his words about this incident. I was deemed 100% disabled by the military and required a cane to walk. My wounds had earned me a purple heart. The war had just ended and I was still in my uniform for God's sake. But on the way home, to the brink of death, they beat me like a common dog. The very same people whose liberties I had fought and suffered to serve, to secure in the horrors of war, they beat me like a dog, merely because I wanted a drink of water. I had watched my best buddies tortured, murdered, and blown to pieces. The French battlefields had literally been stained with my blood and fertilized with the rot of my own loins. So at that moment, I truly felt as if I'd fought on the wrong side. And then, and not until then, did I realize that God, time after time, had taken me to death's door, then spared my life to be a general in the war for human rights and personal dignity. Hosea Williams suffered another beating on Bloody Sunday, but other people were killed during that time. Before the march, Jimmy Lee Jackson, a local black activist, was killed by the police. After the failed first march across the bridge, James Reeb, a white Unitarian minister, father of four who had come from out of town to join the march, was savagely beaten to death in Selma. Viola Luzzo, a young white mother of four who had traveled from Detroit to Alabama and was helping people who finally successfully marched from Selma to Montgomery to get back home by driving them. Her car was ambushed. She was shot to death. The march and the exposure of the country to this violent reaction of what began as a peaceful gathering helped to lead to the historic Voting Rights Act passed by Congress in 1965. Sadly, I fear that that same act is in jeopardy as we hear stories of more attempts at voter suppression, particularly among people of color. When we stood there with Joanne Bland and Selma, where the march began, we were all challenged to stand up for truth and justice whenever and wherever we see it being threatened. So here we are today. As you can see, George Floyd's death was nothing new in the annals of racism in America. The current series of demonstrations that we are witnessing are a new response to an old wound and the stains of the sin of institutional racism in America. Where are we as a church? We, like our spiritual ancestors in the wilderness, have been called to be God's people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. We are called to recount that once we were without mercy, but now we have received mercy. Like it or not, I believe that all of us white folks are also called to examine their own history, their own ancient prejudices and fears, and their complicity in the racist structure of the society, of how we have collective amnesia about where we came from. If we can but remember, then we can be grateful for God's mercy, and we can show mercy and we can think anew and act anew. In this time of significant unrest, there's the innate danger of emotional regression in which we come to merely see an ongoing struggle between those who are scaring the established order with the cry for overdue necessary changes versus those 
for scaring the disaffected with a cry for more, quote, law and order, unquote. Somehow, somewhere, there has to be an avenue for civil discourse to prevail and for careful listening that attends to all of our common human needs. Jesus calls us to be his disciples, just as he called his disciples long ago in today's gospel, to be his servants, because the kingdom of God is drawing near. The work is not easy. It is arduous. But the kingdom of which he speaks is a kingdom of love and of justice and of peace. In whatever way each of us are called, let us work together and pray together. Amen. If you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Through Christ, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Let us pray. Grant, O God, that your holy and life-giving Spirit may so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>